¿Qué pasaría si las noticias que vemos todos los días en los diarios y en la televisión hablaran de las cosas bellas que están emergiendo en el mundo hoy día? ¿Qué pasaría si los WhatsApp que nos mandamos todos los días no fueran de cuidado con esta nueva forma de asalto, si no fueran de las cosas potentes que están emergiendo, positivas. Vivimos en un mundo de mitos, de historias que nos contamos, y sobre esas historias basamos nuestra forma de vivir, nuestra forma de funcionar, nuestra forma de organizarnos. Y con las historias que nos estamos contando hoy día, que estamos viendo en las noticias, cada día, el futuro que vemos, si proyectamos desde ahí hacia adelante, no se ve muy, muy luminoso. Pero eso tiene que ver con lo que nos estamos contando, quizás. ¿cierto? Con lo que sale a la luz, con lo que nos contamos, con lo que aparece en las noticias. Pero hay muchas otras cosas que están pasando al mismo tiempo, del tiempo de caos, de los momentos de caos que estamos viviendo, de los tiempos de cambio, de transición. Están apareciendo nuevos brotes de algo distinto. Yo no veo muchas noticias, pero hoy día estaba en un taller en la mañana y me comentaron del, de lo que pasó en Manchester. Y es terrible, es doloroso, está cambiando el mundo, hay una resistencia. Hay... Y al igual que esto, están pasando en muchas otras partes, cosas peores, en Siria, ¿cierto? Pero a nosotros nos llegan estas noticias. Pero hubo también algo en, esa, en eso que pasó ahí, que no se cuenta tanto, pero que sí aparece también en momentos de caos y de, y de desesperación. Los hoteles de alrededor se abrieron, abrieron sus puertas y se pusieron como albergues para recibir a todos los jóvenes y a todas las familias que estaban desesperadas buscando a sus hijos. Los taxistas liberaron sus servicios para ayudar y ponerse de ambulancias y de, al servicio de la comunidad. Esas historias y muchas otras que ustedes conocen mejor que yo, están pasando hoy día. Hoy día. Y muchas de ellas pasan piola, pasan desapercibidas, no las contamos. Esto a nivel también de las organizaciones, a nivel de las empresas. Nos llegan la mayoría de las noticias de corrupción, de... de ¿cómo se llama? Sobre sueldos, de tantas cosas que ya... Pero también están pasando cosas bellas y cosas nuevas y cosas que nos podrían, si miramos desde esos, con esos otros lentes, prometer un futuro nuevo, un futuro distinto para las organizaciones. Hace, un, hace dos años, ya un año y medio, en diciembre del 2015, vino Frederic Lalú a hablarnos de su investigación en este mismo escenario. De algunas organizaciones que que estaban funcionando ya en el mundo de una manera distinta, desde un lugar distinto. Hoy día viene una de ellas a contarnos cómo funcionan en realidad, desde hace siete, siete años, de manera horizontal, sin jefes, 250 personas, trabajando en proyectos con sentido, con propósito. Y esto no podía ser de otra manera como la historia que les voy a contar ahora de cómo llegamos hoy día aquí, para que sepan. Susan venía a Chile por Marillion. Nada que ver. Y contacta a Miguel y le dice, Miguel, me, mira, voy, voy a Chile por Marillion. Tengo dos días, días libres que me gustaría poner a disposición de la, de la humanidad en el fondo de Chile, por si, por si les sirve escuchar mi experiencia. No tengo ninguna expectativa de, de ganar. Nada de, ¿cierto? Sino que solo de compartir nuestra experiencia. Y Miguel llama a Matrística eh, y Matrística Pato le dice, oye, tenéis que hablar con Diego Cuadra. Me llaman a mí. Y dije, feliz de, hacer, de, de, de tratar de generar algo, pero no podemos solos, ¿cierto? Sumemos a más. Y ahí sumamos a Plataforma Aurea, que los veo ahí en, en más atrás, a Pegas con Sentido, a Fundación Elévate, a Grupo Nortes, a eh, Good Company. Eh, IF y nosotros también, Georgina y el equipo de Kairos Project, 
que se suman para hacerlo esto desde, como mejor sabemos, la colaboración. Y empezamos a, cada uno poniendo desde lo que sabemos, ¿cierto? Fundación Elédate, haciendo toda la parte de flyer e invitación, para ofrecer esto hoy día. Y aparece también la universidad, la Universidad de Chile, que una vez más dice, a nosotros nos gustaría, nos interesa este tema. Nosotros estamos formando los futuros gerentes de, de empresa o trabajadores de las empresas y queremos también mostrarles esta otra parte de las organizaciones, esta otra forma de ser organización. Así nace hoy día. Y hoy día ustedes están acá y son parte de esto. Están siendo, estamos construyendo esto juntos. Porque lo que también vamos a hacer es que no tenemos auspiciadores hoy día. Todos los costos de traducción y, de, y del arriendo del lugar, los, costos, los mínimos, que ya los vamos a compartir, la idea es compartirlo también entre todos, es ser parte, es decir, esto es lo que, lo que nos costó. Nosotros ponemos la hora a disposición y ver cómo funciona desde la abundancia. Es un regalo y ver si es que lo podemos entre todos hacer sustentable para que la rueda siga girando y ver si nacen otras iniciativas como esta, que se autofinancien, que se autosustenten y que generen inspiración. Y quizás, ¿dónde termina esta inspiración? Quiero dejar ahora a, a, a Susan, una mujer que, por lo poco que la he conocido, tiene un corazón gigante, muy generosa. Es muy, tiene una fuerza de, de generar los cambios que quiere ver en el, en el mundo. Tiene una fuerza, una convicción muy potente. Donde ha estado, ha generado esos cambios eh, en, en las empresas. Y, además de eso, tiene una combinación muy bonita porque vive mucho desde la intuición. De hecho, está viviendo hoy día en Nueva Zelanda donde dijo, fui de vacaciones ahí y sentí como mis, mis pies se, le salían raíces en Nueva Zelanda. Y así decidí que, que ese quería que fuera el lugar de mi familia. Así que, Susan, es un honor tenerte aquí para que nos inspires con tu historia y el escenario es todo tuyo. Un aplauso para recibirla. Muchas gracias, Diego. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, it's cool. Enjoy. So, me llamo Susana. Yo vivo en Nuevo Zealand. Gracias por invitarme a compartir con ustedes esta noche. Santiago es un hermoso y elegante lugar. Me gustaría reconocer a los pueblos indígenas de la tierra y la tierra misma. Es un privilegio estar con todos ustedes y gracias por permitir hablar inglés. 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 <laughs> so, so yes, um, my uh, mi esposo and me came um, to Santiago to to see Marillion. Uh, Colin is uh, cousins from Mark Kelly, the keyboard player in the band, and he actually took this picture. Um, from the tower, I think on Saturday. Was Saturday the day that we had a very clear day? So I just wanted to make note of, of his contribution to tonight. Um, there are many stories we tell ourselves. There are many opportunities that we have to change ourselves, to change the way that we decide that we want to be with each other, with work, within society, with our neighbors, with our families. The choice that we have for what we bring into this world starts with connections. So I'm not going to stand up here and speak to you for an hour or two at least to get started, and we need some participation. So the first invitation is I'd like you to turn to the person closest to you and share with them what brought you here tonight. What are you hoping to learn? And possibly, what are you hoping to give? I will give you two minutes to do this, starting now.
You should go. F you should go find. You should go find somebody that's not talking to everybody. Yeah, like this guy on the end here. Go talk to him. I'm not speaking. It's all right. Okay, so I'm expecting that that was interesting. Maybe you learned something about the person next to you. Maybe you shared something that you didn't expect or heard something you didn't expect. But that was the easy part. It's very easy to, to, sit, to turn to the person next to you and have a conversation. This next part is a little harder. I'd like to invite everybody to stand up. And I'd like to invite you to turn around and look around the room and catch the eye of somebody on the other side of the room and slowly move towards them. I want everybody moving. We should have some music. It could be like musical chairs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Has everybody found somebody new? I'll invite you to have the same conversation with the person you've never met before.
I, I'm glad that Santiago knows this, this tool, this cultural tool that works with five-year-olds and 50-year-olds. So thank you. Hands up, mouth shut. Uh, if everybody could go back to their seat now, thank you. Some microphone, some microphone. I'm just going to ask for some audience feedback. All right. So for me, I really believe that change starts with a conversation. Change starts with conversations with friends and family and workmates and colleagues, but it also starts with a conversation from somebody whose eye you catch across the room. This is, this is how we build a movement, and this is how we change what's possible. So I, I'm, not, I'm not going to ask you what your discussion was, or what you heard, or what you learned, but I am interested, anybody in the room that would like to share, what did the process feel like? Do you understand? What did the process of doing this exercise feel like? Was it scary? Was it easy? It felt like a conversation, you know, it's easy to make friends. Everybody seems to be looking at, uh, for something, and uh, so we have something to share. So it, it wasn't so hard if, after all. What, what was your system for catching the eye of somebody across the room? Well, um, by the time I turned around, everybody was already moving, and um, so I, I walked. I, I didn't catch the eye of anybody at first. I just um, walked until... You asked us to stop, and then whoever I, greet, I was next to, I talked to. Thank you. Anybody else like to share what it felt like? Over here, Diego, you're going to have to do some running. <laughs> uh, it felt very exciting uh, to uh, meet somebody from this audience, because you know they're coming from the same uh, place. So uh, I wish we could know everyone because you see that there are kindred spirits in here. And my system to catch somebody's eyes is just like the same system in a party. You just look for somebody, and then when you catch somebody that you like, you just stare at them and say, like, I want you. Nice one. That's my system. Uh, excellent. I recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. One more? In the back. Nosotros somos un grupo que venimos aquí de la Universidad de Uniac, pero para mí fue muy satisfactorio conversar aquí con la señorita porque ella habla de lo sustentable. Pero yo en mi rol personal específicamente eh, ayudo a los animalitos porque ellos son parte del planeta. Entonces si los seres humanos no somos capaces de cuidar lo que está en el planeta, que son incluyendo los animales, ¿qué se puede esperar de nosotros? Eso sería... Y, y realmente encuentro que esto es muy importante porque es una nueva, es como una nueva manera de vivir y comenzar de cero. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, and and I also I really believe that we are all here because we sense something collective, individually and collectively, and I'm very interested in understanding how we can start to recognize each other. Oh no, this is a, a big trick, but I think that it could be possible. I think um, we were talking today. I was I was hosted in uh, we were hosted in Valparaiso by uh, Platform Aurea, and we were talking about um, and we'll bring this up at the end. The Tibetan singing bowls, you know, they're different sizes and they all have different um, amplitudes and meters, and just the idea that if we could play play the sound for people to hear and and come and join us. Because it's not about, we're not missionaries. We're not trying to convert anybody, right? We're just trying to share our experience, share our stories, and share what's possible. So from my perspective, I think, well, I know, in some ways, I'm a very slow learner, yes? 
It took me 25 years of wor working in big corporate multinationals to figure it out. Uh, companies like IBM and British Petroleum and Telstra, where I was in senior leadership positions, only able to influence or make possible something different from my very narrow silo, as thin as a sashimi slice in these organizations, right? And however much we tried and however much we were, we were able to be innovative within our little area of control or however much we were able to try to be different and try to be collaborative, as soon as it bumps up against that intransigent hierarchy in these organizations that have no motivation and no reason to change, or at least that's what they think, it starts to get shut down. You start to get bullied. You start to have uh, budget taken away. You might start to uh, lose opportunities. But the interesting thing is, when I was operating within that paradigm, I was complicit, right? Because I was, you know, always, not always, but often trying, well, what can I do to get the next run up, rung up the ladder? What can I do to raise my band a little bit so I can be on the next pay grade, right? And equally, even in this hegemonic patriarchal paradigm, I was, as a leader, as a manager, being put into a position of power over other individuals that I never asked for. So this is something I really didn't used to think about, is you know, if, I, if I had a team of 12 or 15, I think my biggest, the biggest team I was responsible in IBM was 60 people, where I had the actual power of whether they had a job or they didn't. I never asked for that power. I don't want that power. I don't think that power is healthy or generative or positive to anybody, not to the people and not to myself. But I always, I always tried, and it, it eventually it became a, a situation of enough was enough. My heart got broken so many times where you try to do something and something great would happen and then it would get, it would get shut down or ignored. So I like this image of, it was almost like I had to wrap barbed wire around my heart to protect it. And how sad and tragic is it that my work caused such pain? I mean, let's be honest, I'd like to see the hands of those of you that work in organizations. How many of you in the room have had, had work cause you pain? Yeah. And if you haven't yet, you will, right? And it, and it doesn't need to be that way. So about three years ago, I finally said enough. And at, at about that time, um, I read Fred's book and started talking to people that were experimenting with uh, a different relationship to livelihood. And I said I was a slow learner. The other thing that dawned on me like this was, I used to always think that my personal development, yeah, so the stuff when I go and, you know, go and sit on top of a mountain for a week and meditate or cogitate or go to yoga class or whatever else I'm doing to do my personal development, I used to think that it was separate from my professional development. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, I don't think there's such thing as a work-life balance. I think it's all life. And I think that our opportunity and our choice is to find a way to integrate the things that fulfill us that make us happy, that allow us to share our gifts, allow us to grow, and allow us to be happy, can happen through work as well if we make that choice. I was tired of making small incremental internal changes. When I say this, though, I know that there's some of you in this room today that are working for 
big, old, traditional, hierarchical organizations. And you need to be there making that incremental change. But if you get to the point where you're feeling like you're losing a little bit of your soul every day when you walk into the door, consider that you have a choice. Talked about reinventing organizations. We all know this book. I, how many of you came to see Fred when he was here? If you hadn't, if you haven't, if you didn't, you probably heard about it. Um, so when I read Reinventing Organizations, I flipped through the pages and sort of tears rolling down my face because it was like finally somebody had written and articulated what I'd been feeling inside the whole time. I always used to think I was the, the, the kind of crazy kid sitting in the corner rocking back and forth that, you know, I was somehow odd or strange for thinking that things could be possible this way. When I read that book, I felt alive, I felt recognized, and I felt, whew, now I can find my tribe. The other book that changed everything for me is a more recent book. I think it was just released last year. A book called An Everyone Culture by Robert Keegan, who is, um, has been studying um, human development at Harvard since the 1960s. I, I love this story. That, um, I think he's been doing this work since the 1960s. And back then, and up until about maybe 10 years ago, he was considered a soft scientist, and the hard neuroscientists would, would meet him in the hallway or in the break room and say, oh, Robert, you're crazy, because we all know that the brain stops developing when we're about 21 or 22. He said, no, 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 no. About 10 years ago, of course, 10, 15 years ago, the, the machines caught up, and so now we can see, obviously, that our brains continue to develop until the day that we die. So he was kind of proved right there. Um, but what a deliberately developmental organization is, is a, it's a book that's much like reinventing organizations in that it's a curation of organizations that have found a way to make development part of their culture. So instead of the learning and development opportunities at the organization being something that the HR department put together every year as part of um, either an accelerated leadership program or uh, more on the side of your competence and your work. It's the idea that all of our work experiences provide the opportunity not only for professional growth, but personal growth as well. So I really suggest that if you're interested in this kind of work, that the, the book about deliberately developmental organizations feels very much like the ne the, the, a next integrated step for what the future of work could look like. <clears throat> now, those of the, you that have read Reinventing Organizations will be really familiar with the three teal breakthroughs or the three breakthroughs that Frederick um, has rec recognized in the organizations that he found, curated, talked to, interviewed in the book. And the first one is self-management. So the idea that every individual has the capability and the op opportunity to be accountable for the work that they do. That we can be in relationship with one another in a non-hierarchical way, make accountabilities and commitments to each other in a way that holds us to account from an intrinsically motivated p position rather than an extrinsically motivated coercive position coming from top down. And it lets us do this in a way that we can be whole with ourselves. So the idea of wholeness that, I like to think of this as the potential cure to the scourge of scarcity in the workplace, right? So we've been taught that the only thing that's valued in professional workplaces is this very narrow, rational, masculine perspective on the problem. But what if, just what if, you were invited to bring your creativity to the problem, you were invited to bring your silliness to the problem, 
you're invited to bring your music to the problem. You're invited to bring your sports experience to the problem. You are invited to bring your poetry to the problem. I was invited to bring my feminine side to the problem. Because this was something that I squished down for many, many years. I, I, I received a great compliment a couple of weeks ago when I was speaking, speaking in Montreal, and that was that they, the, somebody in the audience felt like I stood very strong in my female energy. And that was such a gift to me because for so long in the business world, I focused on being masculine. So if all of a sudden, how many, how many different attributes did I name? Five or six or 10? All of a sudden, we've got five or six or eight different perspectives on the same opportunity or same problem simply because we're creating an environment where you are safe and welcomed to bring more of who you are to everything you do. What could be possible if we decided that we valued more than a ma masculine rational pr perspective at work. And then the third breakthrough is probably, was the hardest one for me to grasp at first, but now I think I understand it the best. So the idea of evolving purpose, the idea that an organization is the amalgamation of the people that are sitting in the room around the table that day, what everybody had for breakfast, what the weather's out, at, like outside. That it's an entity itself that is continually changing and evolving and morphing, and from one day to another, from one year to the next, it's different. It's growing, it's dying, it's letting go. The image that I like is uh, f from New Zealand, actually. So I imagine the first bird that got blown over this volcanic island and, excuse me, pooped out a seed, right? Something grew. Nobody could have imagined what was going to grow, what the weather was going to be like, what the soil was like, but something amazing emerged and it's the same in organizations. Where the deliberately developmental part comes in as well is that, and it's similar to the wholeness, in most organizations almost everybody is doing a second job. Covering their weaknesses, trying to look their best, never showing any weakness, never asking for help. It's heartbreaking. What if we were to weave development in the, to, into the fabric of our working life and our organizations to allow our prime motivation as humans, which is this impulse to grow, to be released? So you might be looking at me say, saying, OK, yeah, this is all good theory, hypothetical stuff. But for the last two and a half years, I've been involved with and part of an organization who practices this every day. And I'm just going to show you a little video to start. Inspiro began as a group of freelancers and activists in Wellington, New Zealand, Can you hear? who wanted to work collaboratively and have a positive social impact. So they started sharing resources and jobs. A range of professionals, from computer programmers and designers to lawyers and accountants, have been drawn to this new way of working together. The network continues to grow across New Zealand and around over. the world, collaborating online using digital tools and offline in a shared co-working space and at regular retreats. Teams come together around a we'll Inspiral it. began as a group of freelancers and activists in Wellington, New Zealand, who wanted to work collaboratively and have a positive social impact. So they started sharing resources and jobs. A range of professionals, from computer programmers and designers to lawyers and accountants, have been drawn to this new way of working together. 
The network continues to grow across New Zealand and around the world, collaborating online using digital tools and offline in a shared co-working space and at regular retreats. Teams come together around inspiring ideas and launch social enterprises. In Spiral Ventures contribute money, time, and skills as shared resources to the Inspiral Foundation. Everyone decides how to spend the budget together through a process of collaborative funding where anybody can propose projects. People engage with Inspiral at different levels. Friends form the wider ecosystem of supporters. Contributors participate in collective decision making, propose projects for collaborative funding, and often work for Inspiral Ventures. Foundation members steward the culture and social mission and collectively own the foundation. Inspiral creates innovative participatory tools and processes and open sources them. It's all in service to the vision that began it all. More people working on stuff that matters. I have to apologize to the translators because they were so grateful that I spoke with an American accent instead of a Kiwi accent. <laughs> And then, and then all of a sudden, we've got back to the, uh, to the Kiwi accent. So I don't expect you to understand everything about Inspiral from that video, but hopefully it will give you a bit of, a, a bit of an understanding. So the important thing to know about Inspiral is Inspiral is not a company. You don't get a job at Inspiral. Inspiral is a relationship. So Inspiral is a self-selecting community of entrepreneurs, accountants, uh, designers, uh, consultants, facilitators, uh, social workers who have chosen to be in relationship with one another. Now, I, I know that sounds really bizarre. There's about 250 of us around the world, and 200 are contributors, so just people who generally associate regularly with the network, and there are 40 of us who collectively own the foundation. We each have one non-financial share in the Inspiral Foundation. It's a limited liability company with a charitable constitution. Your involvement, one's involvement within Spiral can be either as an individual freelancer or entrepreneur, or what actually happened about four or five years ago was that people got together, especially at retreats, because we go on retreat at least twice a year, and started talking about their dreams of companies, their entrepreneurial visions and companies started bubbling up. So to, ha, how many of you have heard of Lumio? Anybody heard of Lumio? You've heard of Lumio? So Lumio is probably the best known open source collective decision making software on the planet. It's used by over 160,000 individuals to make decisions without coercion. I'll talk a little bit more about Lumio later. We also have organizations like uh, Lifehack, which is a joint venture between some Inspiral people and the New Zealand government focused on better mental health care outcomes for young people. As I mentioned before, there's a traditional accounting firm. So five individuals who resonate with the Inspiral mission who started Inspiral Accounting. Now, you may be thinking, what's in it for them? Why would a company either want to be part of Inspiral or want to join Inspiral? It's precisely because we are inventing it as we go along. And this is a mission that can amplify more voices with not only um, emotional support, but financial support as well. So the way the foundation funds itself is, very simply, at the minimum, once a year you pay a subscription fee of $100. $50 of that goes to the costs of the foundation, 
and $50 of that remains in your bank account, and you have the ability to spend that money on whatever project you want to within the Inspiral Network. We are built for high trust. And the reason we've been able to design for high trust is because you must be invited to join. It's a relationship. It's not a job. When you hear about Inspiral, you might come to a summer festival, like this gentleman in the back row here, a friend of his, Erica, came just randomly from Boulder, Colorado to the Inspiral, Inspiral Summer Festival last year, had a wonderful experience, made some relationships, and said, I'm interested in joining. Will somebody invite me? My personal relationship with Inspiral is really interesting. So I'd known about Inspiral for many years. It started in 2011 in Wellington, where, where we were living at the time. And it was uh, quite the thing. I thought, this is so cool. This is a co-working space where it's not just a bunch of coders with their headphones on typing. It's actually people that are starting companies, starting ventures together, and collaborating. In about 2013, Inspiral, this is funny, now I'm going back on my, my um, story saying that Inspiral doesn't have any jobs. Inspiral placed its first and only job advertisement ever. And it was for something called a foundation catalyst. Now, in the organization where you have no bosses and no named power, who does the work? Yeah. This was becoming an anti-pattern that was showing up in many ways. So I saw this advertisement, and I read it, and I was like, my heart just leapt. This is, this is what I've been, this is what my life's work is about. And you know what I did? I did nothing. I was so wounded, I was so afraid, that I would be rejected. What, what are these cool kids going to want with a washed up middle-aged corporate refugee? I did nothing. And it wasn't until a year later that I finally picked up the phone, again, because of another conversation that I'd had with our friend um, Doug Kirkpatrick from Morningstar, who's featured in Fred's book. I was talking to Doug, and he said, Susan, you're in New Zealand and Spiral's in New Zealand. Why aren't you talking to them? And I said, you know what, Doug? I need to get over my fear of being rejected by the cool kids and get on the phone and call them. And I had a coffee with Rich Bartlett, and that led to a lunch and another lunch. And then I took Colin with me to the summer festival just to make sure it wasn't a cult because I wasn't quite, and he gave, me the, he, he, he gave me the thumbs up so it was okay to join. But that was my relationship, and that's how I joined Inspiral. So the key point here is Inspiral is not a job, it's a relationship. And again, I love this image because you can't tell who's leading and who's following. This is kind of what Inspiral is like. Because there are no bosses, there's no coercion, and your level of participation is completely up to you, one might wonder, how does the work actually get done? For the first two or three years, it was the people with the most energy, maybe with the most resources so they could be doing more volunteer hours and more time to do the work. But what was starting to emerge was this anti-pattern of social capital that was becoming a little bit unhealthy. Ha, ha, anybody in the room read um, a paper by a woman called Jo Freeman in 1970 called The Tyranny of Structurelessness? If you not write it down. It's a really good one. You should read it. But that's what it talks about. In the women's movement in the 1970s, it was the same. In this green... Uh, environment where everybody was trying to be equal and nobody was wanting to put their hand up and say, 
this is what I'm standing for. Will you give me consent to do this? It all became like the playground again, backbiting, people with more context, getting more power, the people that had the, the, at the attitude and the um, ability to do the work were doing the work, but they weren't getting recognized, and they weren't getting paid, and they were getting blamed if things went bad. On the other side, you had, and I have to say mostly women, doing a lot of the emotional labor to support individuals in a quite a chaotic environment, and it just it could have actually just spun out of control. But fortunately, we are a community that is values transparency and open, honest dialogue above almost anything else. And so we decided that we needed to have some agreements about how we wanted to work together. And some of the agreements that have been created over the last two or three years are things like catalysts. So if you can think of a catalyst as the, the CEO, the COO, and the CFO in a normal organization, uh, we are self-selecting individuals who kind of take oversight of the big picture. The most frustrating, I've been a catalyst for a little over a year now. My biggest frustration, since this is an open invitation, is why aren't more people joining and want to be catalysts? It took me a while to realize it was because not everybody derives joy from doing that work, from looking at the big picture, from seeing all the moving parts. You, for example, might be the, a great marketeer. So the idea, why don't we start a concept called working groups. So we have a communications working group where people with a passion for PR and marketing and design work, do the work of the network within that working group. We've got an ambassador's working group. We've got a financial working group. We've got a well-being working group. And in this way, we've been able to further distribute the leadership of the network so that people can have the opportunity to not commit to having to oversee the whole thing, but can joyfully commit to doing the work and giving the contribution that they want to give. Another thing that started happening a couple of years ago, again, in an organization that's based on relationships, I told you before the way that you join as a contributor as you're invited in. The way that you, and the, what we like to say is a contributor is somebody that one member trusts. But in order to be a member, to actually steward the, the central core of the network, all of the members have to trust you. And even getting to 40, it's very difficult to have an intimate, personal, trusting relationship with 40 people. So we went away last, last, uh, last uh, June, and our mid-year retreat was on the concept of stewardship. What does it mean to be a steward? What does it mean to be a steward to the land? What does it mean to be, to, to be to a steward of the organization? And what does it mean to be a steward to one another? And we decided stewardship is not mentorship. It's not coaching. It's not an adult child, some kind of weird power matrix thing. It's simply me having a relationship with Diego, where once a month, I call Diego up and say, let's go for a coffee. And we go for a coffee, and the one question that I ask Diego is, how is your heart? Now, I'm going to try to show you another video in Spanish about Lumio. But before I do that, I wanted to give you a little bit of the history of Lumio. So one of the things that, especially when I'm talking to organizations or groups that want to experiment with this no hierarchy, consent-based decision-making stuff, they say, Susan, where do we start? And I often say, you need to decide how you want to make decisions. There are many ways to make decisions. 
You can delegate decisions to somebody. You can choose to have consensus-based decision-making where everybody absolutely has to agree. Or you can use a more of a sociocratic method of decision-making, which means that anybody has the power to make a decision, as, and, and as long as nobody blocks it because it's somehow harmful to the organization, then you have the power to enact that particular decision. Um, did the Occupy movement make it to Santiago at all? So the Occupy Wall Street movement made it, made it to Wellington, New Zealand. And for about three months, there was a camp. And every day, the members of the camp sat around in a circle, had a general assembly, and tried to make decisions together. Very painful. When you're trying to get to consensus with individuals that you don't really know, what happens in a circle anyway? The person with the loudest voice gets the most attention. Uh, people that have a uh, preference for extroverted thinking, I, people that, that make, their, make sense of the world by conversation are privileged in that environment. People with a preference for, for, more, for a more introverted, quiet reflection don't have time to actually even figure out what's going on before the somebody is calling for a decision. So some of the individuals that participated in Occupy in Wellington came to Inspiral and said, we'd love to figure out a way where we could help organizations make decisions in a way that actually honors all of our preferences. And Lumio was invented, created. So Lumio, quite simply, is a piece of software that allows anybody in the organization to start a discussion for a particular project or proposal, allows anybody to feed into that, into that discussion. When the individual who raises the discussion feels like they have enough context or enough information, they will raise a proposal, and the proposal will get voted on. So maybe we can try to show the video now. So the Podemos movement in Spain um, have been using Lumio for quite some time. Lumio es una herramienta de Internet amigable y sencilla para la colaboración en grupo. Proporciona un espacio neutral e independiente donde los grupos toman decisiones conjuntas. Aquí vemos a un grupo de personas que trabajan juntas. No tienen tiempo para un montón de reuniones y el correo electrónico no sirve para discusiones complejas con muchas personas a la vez. Veamos cómo en su lugar usan Lumio. Todo el mundo puede iniciar una discusión sobre cualquier tema. Es sencillo y claro. Se puede incluir texto o adjuntar archivos, imágenes, documentos o enlaces de Internet. La descripción inicial puede editarse siempre, pudiendo así actualizarse según va progresando la discusión. La discusión del grupo se da en el lado izquierdo de la pantalla. Cualquiera puede añadir información y dar su perspectiva. Esta parte del proceso no tiene un límite de tiempo. Cuanta más gente participa, el asunto se comprende mejor y las ideas comienzan a emerger. Cuando una solución potencial aflora, cualquiera puede iniciar una propuesta, la cual tendrá un plazo de tiempo definido. La toma de decisiones se desarrolla en el lado derecho. Cuando alguien manifiesta su posición, es invitado a dar un resumen de una frase explicando su decisión. Esto permite ver fácilmente por qué lo consideran de esa forma y resalta los puntos principales. Las personas que llegan tarde a la discusión pueden rápidamente ponerse al día y observar qué se discute y ver cómo lo ve el grupo. La gente puede establecer sus propios compromisos de tiempo y nivel de dedicación. Si tienes objeciones serias, puedes usar el botón rojo. Puedes cambiar de opinión sobre tu posición según nueva información vaya apareciendo. Las personas llegan a comprender cosas sobre las que podrían no haber pensado en un primer momento. También puedes mencionar a personas específicas para notificarlas. A veces, el fracaso de una primera propuesta puede ser el paso para una nueva propuesta que tenga en cuenta las preocupaciones de todos. Lumio crea automáticamente un archivo de la discusión y de las decisiones pasadas, por lo que es muy fácil ver cómo se produjo una decisión. El grupo converge en una solución que funciona para todos. Este proceso flexible y dinámico libera la sabiduría colectiva, llegando juntos a mejores resultados de los que cualquier individuo se le habrían ocurrido por su cuenta. Todo el mundo se siente escuchado y permite alcanzar decisiones de alta calidad para el grupo con el máximo consenso. Al final de la discusión, puede resaltar el resultado producido para que todos lo vean. 
el panel de Lumio muestra todas las decisiones abiertas. Es sencillo buscar discusiones pasadas o iniciar una nueva. Lumio ayuda a los grupos a tomar grandes decisiones en conjunto, incrementando la eficacia y el compromiso. Puedes iniciar tu propio grupo de Lumio hoy mismo. So this is one example of a piece of technology that followed culture. This is another thing that we notice at Inspiral, is that many times we assume in organizations we can put in a piece of technology and that will make our culture somehow different. I think one of the things that have has been so helpful and successful at Inspiral is that we have noticed the patterns in our culture and designed software to support that what, rather, the, rather than the other way around. But I think that we've done it in a, in a, in a clever and a, in a good way so that organizations that have the same uh, feeling and impulse as we do um, can use them easily. What kind of decisions do we make together? So, We can make a decision about whether or not or where we park our bikes. But we also make decisions about what, if we should adopt a, an agreement. So an agreement is something that we need to get um, a level of participation in the discussion with. Because if it's going to become an agreement of the network, we need to ensure that We're giving as much possibility as people, for people to participate in the discussion as possible. Now remember, even though Inspiral started in Wellington, we're currently completely global. So the only way that we can effectively and efficiently make decisions as a group is by using technology. The other thing that Lumio has allowed that I think is something that is absolutely imperative in these types of networks and communities is the appreciation for dissenting opinions, right? So in so many organizations, if we're striving for consensus, it's paring down the words so that they're exactly perfect so nobody can pick at a particular word from a semantic point of view to something that maybe goes against and doesn't really feel right for somebody. But you are encouraged to express that dissent in a way that is healthy, in a way that is positive, in a way that is accepted, in a way that is actually generative for the network. So this is another trust building mechanism that we have in Inspiral is that dissenting opinions are encouraged. But just because you dissent and disagree doesn't mean necessarily that you will block the decision. A thumbs up is yes, green, definitely, this is great, I support it 100%. The yellow thumb, the sideways thumb is normally I'm way busy, I don't have time to engage with this, but I trust the group. A down thumb is, I really think we could do better, but I'm not going to block this. So the use of block is something that is very serious and is taken very seriously. In the past year, we've only had one block. Because we take the time to have these conversations over a couple of weeks, so that people can ask questions, they can get comfortable, they can give input, so that what comes out the other end is almost always something that is not dangerous to try. And that's, I think, the difference in how many organizations approach making decisions together. We don't need to all agree. The next important piece of Inspiral is how we spend our money together. So I spoke earlier that there's a couple of ways that money gets into the system. It gets into, into the system through your um, annual subscription. If you are part of a venture, 
So Lumio or Lifehack or Inspiral Accounting, every month they contribute something to the Inspiral Foundation, half of which goes to the foundation, half of which stays in the co-budget. What the ventures contribute is completely up to them. There is no fixed percentage. There is no fixed um, expectation. And again, this is something that we can only do and we can only thrive and survive on this trust-based system where I know that if my company is doing well that month, I will be able to share my bounty in abundance with Inspiral. And as an individual as well, you can choose to put money in every month or you can choose not to. I think we've got a tab here for co-budget. Let me just show you in practice how it works. Yeah, here we go. So for example, this is a live co-budget. So you can see now that there is $13,177 in the Inspiral Foundation co-budget fund. I've spent all my money this month, so I don't have any money to spend. We can see what's being funded now is um, to recover some previous debt and to uh, update some assets for a conference that we run every year in Wellington called Open Source, Open Society. We can also see the things that have been funded over the past month. So Thanks John is um, a, an amazing guy called John Guerin, who's an activist who lives in Indiana, who participates fully in, in Spiral and he took, took the opportunity to come and visit us, so we gave him some money um, again for that. I love this project, Otakaro Edible Orchard Christchurch. Um, a year after your big earthquake here in um, Concepcion, Christchurch, New Zealand was devastated by an earthquake as well. And the Otakaro Orchard is a project in the, city, in the center of, of the city, 85% of all of the buildings were destroyed and demolished. So there was a nice big uh, piece of land in the center of Christchurch that um, some inspiral, inspired people are turning into an edible orchard for the, um, for the city. So part of a food sustainability project for Christchurch. So that's another project. Um, supporting some grassroots action for getting um, some, of our, some of our Lumio compatriots um, to help some of the activists um, fighting Trump in the U.S., for example. So, so, so this is and and this is an, an you can think of it like an internal crowdfunding. But what this started out as was it just was it just a budget spreadsheet, and people were randomly deciding what to fund. But this, we feel, is a far more productive and generative way for each individual. Again, we're self-managed. We don't have any bosses, and there's no coercion one way or another to decide what projects at Inspiral are important enough to fund. So that's co-budget. And again, this is another piece of um, software, another tool that um, came from what we were doing culturally that then um, turned into a piece of software that is um, uh, available all over the world. And I'm especially excited about CoBudget because um, three amazing women have put their hands up to run CoBudget as a business moving forward. So keep your eye, eye out for them. And I always love it when the, when the women stand up and do something technical. So I've talked a little bit about stewardship and why it's important to us. So how do we take care of humans and nourish a high trust network? Well, we do it via our cultural tools. We sit in circles a lot, which I love to do. I wish this room could make a circle. Um, we do things like simple things like check-ins. So before we start any meeting, we will take a minute or two to just check in. And that's as simple as, what's on top for you today? And I might say, I'm really tired today. I didn't have a very good night's sleep, but I'm happy to be here with you now, for example. But just being able to just take a breath 
and not launch straight into a meeting, which is what we do all the time, right? Okay, we're all here. What's the agenda? Let's get cracking. Just whoo, tranquil, right? <laughs> Just take a minute or two to be in human connection. And, and, and sometimes I do this three or four times a day, but I appreciate it every single time. Uh, let's see if I have, oh, I think I might have closed this. We do a lot of, um, we do a lot on Slack. And um, so we have got a, an incredibly busy Slack channel, as you can see. But I love this. My favorite channel on Slack is Thanks. So this is just a place where people randomly come every day and just thank somebody for doing something cool. So Joriam saying thanks to Kate. Um, Sandra saying thanks, to, thanks for the ride to the party. But it's just such a lovely way to keep in touch and respect and just keep that human contact. Because in spiral is not a job. In spiral is a relationship. This is the way that our stewarding circle works. So, for example, Rohan stewards Jesse, Jesse stewards Rose, Rose stewards Malcolm, Malcolm stewards Becca, Becca stewards me. And every six months, we do a roulette of the wheel, and everybody gets a different, a different steward. Retreats are so important to us. We're lucky in New Zealand. We don't have to go very far to find a beautiful place with a cabin and a fire and a river and trees and nature. To just go for a weekend, eat together, just be in communion with each other and see what happens. Because that's what the, when the magic happens, right? When we get out of our normal environment, and we think or talk deeply on a subject, or not. Maybe we just sit around playing music. Maybe we don't do anything. But the opportunity to actually physically be together, which is becoming more and more important for us because we are so spread out now. Last year I said, we, so every year in the summertime we do our big festival, but in the mid-year we do uh, particular topic, like I said, last year we did stewardship. This year we're going to do growth. About 18 months ago, Inspiral went from being very inwardly focused, just focusing on ourselves, to kind of just looking over our shoulders a little bit. And we found even the action of doing that meant that people started waving at us. Oh, in Spiral, oh, I've heard of you guys. What do you do? Come talk to us, we're really interested. And that has just spiraled and spiraled and spiraled. I, by the end of June, I w I've, I'm fortunate. <laughs> I've been away more than I've been home this year. And by the end of June, I will probably have had the opportunity to share the Inspiral story with two or 3,000 people. But I'm not doing that because I want more Inspirals. No. Inspiral is not here to colonize. We are here to give you confidence that you can try your own version of whatever that is here. If you need a foot up, you can use some of our processes. Our handbook is completely open source. You can come and take anything you need. Lumio is free. CoBudget is free. We are not here to colonize. We're here to give confidence. I just like these retreat pictures because they're very cool. It's really our heartbeat, our rhythms and our rituals. One of the last things that I'd like to talk about is my own personal relationship to livelihood within Inspiral. So 
leaving corporate life, leaving the so-called security of that paycheck is difficult, right? So when I first left, I went out on my own, and I started contracting, and I started consulting, and I was, oh, I need to be around people. I don't want to do this by myself. I don't want to do this by myself. And it was just about then when I had the conversation with my friend Doug, and he said, go visit Inspiral. So I get into Inspiral, and you have to find your own way. We have some processes and some onboarding things and opportunities to get into a cohort of new people and kind of have uh, some guideposts to find your way around. But at the end of the day, the work that you find is up to you. And I first started just working my freelance gigs and um, paying a percentage into Inspiral and serving the network as a foundation catalyst. About a year ago, four of us, myself uh, and my colleagues, Kate, Kate Beecroft, Damien Sligo-Green, and Joshua Vile, who was, he calls himself the ex-founder of Inspiral, but he was the one that first rented the co-working space and decided that he wanted to shift his reality from working his ass off three days a week on really high value contracts so that he could spend two weeks a day doing the stuff that mattered to him to trying to figure out if his work could actually be the something that mattered, not only to him, but to have a social impact in the community. And it, it really touched me at um, one of the circles uh, at the, at the uh, summer festival, he, he shared something different that I hadn't heard him say before. When he, when he, I get choked up when I think about this. He, he got, gets asked the question all the time, why did you start in Spiral? What, where did the impulse come from? Why? What were you thinking? Did you have any idea? And he just kind of looked at us and he said, I started in Spiral because I was lonely. I needed my people. I needed to find my people. So the four of us decided uh, we, we were inspired by um, a company within Inspiral called Root Systems. So Root Systems is a group of six software developers. And about two years ago, they were noticing, so they all kind of shared desks around in the same co-working space, and they were noticing that um, their, their, um, their pay was up and down, depending on who had a contract and when they were getting paid, and maybe somebody would get paid one month, but then they wouldn't have any work for a couple of months, and it was going up and down like this. And they sort of suddenly looked at each other and said, you know what, I, if we put all our money together, then maybe we could even out these these peaks and troughs. And that was the idea or the concept for what we now call livelihood pods. A livelihood pod can be better defined as a intentional professional family where we put all of our money into the middle. So everything we earn every month goes into one pot. And every month, we sit in a circle or on a Zoom, virtual or, or, or together, and have a conversation about our livelihood needs. We don't take more than we need. We don't take less than we need. But we trust each other enough that the value that we provide, not only to one another, but to our community and around the work that we are doing, is sufficient in abundance to provide the livelihood we need. There's, there's now three livelihood pods in Inspiral, so we're very excited about this as a, as a mode and um, something potentially moving forward that could be a, a, a very different relationship to money. And I can see your eyes kind of going, oh, really? How, can you, how could you have that trust? I don't know. We just do. And it was, it was funny because Kate's father is, a, is a, an accountant or a lawyer or something, and, and he said to her, well, how do you know that somebody's not just going to empty the bank account? 
we just know, right? We design for high trust. Because it's our choice, right? It's our choice to decide that this is how we want to be with our work. And when I had the opportunity to come to Chile, everybody knows it's sort of a holiday, right? I'm not earning any money this week. But all of the golden pandas, that's the name of my livelihood pod, said thumbs up, Susan, go to Chile. Go to Chile, take some opportunities, talk to some fine people, and we'll earn the money while you're away. We've got plenty of bamboo. So I shared this before. Everything and in spiral is public. There is no such thing as intellectual property. I know this is very triggering for some people, but I, I believe that you can't own a thought. As soon as the thought is out there in the world, it has to belong to everybody, right? But I also believe that if you don't document it, it's not open source. Because if you haven't documented it, how can you share it? So everything that we do at Inspiral is documented and it's open source. And you're absolutely free to copy, remix, fork, change, improve everything. So I'm just going to show you quickly the handbook. There we go. So this is the Inspiral handbook. Pretty simple. Uh, slideshows, videos. Oh, one thing that I should share with you that's really cool too is in Spiral Tales. So our main uh, propaganda outlet is in Spiral Tales on Medium, where e anybody in the network, and actually anybody who resonates with our mission, can ins can um, submit a story for in Spiral Tales, and then it's so good I have to show you. Hold on. So here we go. Stories from a bold experiment creating collaborative network that helps people do meaningful work. So everything from five reasons to build a network of small groups rather than a mass movement. Participatory organizing from a co-op to a network. Life and death in La Frontera. This is uh, really interesting. I told, we, you saw before that Rich and Nati are in the US. They um, did some work a couple of weeks ago on the Mexican frontier with some activists that are helping to, to put water on the, road, on, the, on the side of the road so people can, yeah, it's, it's a great article <laughs> anyway. Um, and yeah, I mean, everything from zombie hunting tactics to like really intensive um, academic stuff from our friend Sam Rye about the relational field. So yeah, I, I really um, encourage you to have a look at uh, Inspiral Tales. But back to the handbook. Uh, here we go. <clears throat> As I said before, uh, we have a structure in the organization, and it goes like this. Agreements are the official legislation that governs the Inspiral Network, and changing these requires a formal process. So if we cl click on agreements, we can see we've got a board agreement, which ta talks all about what the board of directors do, the roles and responsibilities, selection and composition, everything that you'd expect from a, um, yeah, from a, a you know, a, a book of proceedings from an organization. Uh, the latest agreement is the brand agreement. So this t talks about how, um, how you get your brand, you can use the, the Inspiral name in your brand to the stewardship agreement. We also have guides. So the guides talk about everything from how to blog and add stories to Inspiral Tales, how we do our conflict resolution, uh, what our values are, 
the messages sent to new contributors, what the retreats are about, songs we sing together. So this is all 100% open source. And um, feel free to take it and use it and do whatever you want with it. Lumio also has a really great um, handbook. So hopefully, <laughs> my sharing about Inspiral felt like a really clear example of the evolving purpose of a network, a thing, an organization, a relationship, a community. We are very <coughs> proud of the fact that we're perpetual beta. We're never going to be finished. Things are changing continually. We're iterating continually. And all of, the, all of us in this room Catalina said it earlier. We've got a, what were the words that you used? About the, about the um, how it's incumbent upon us to share this story. It's a duty for us to share that something else is possible. That everything that's, and, and, and you know, all <laughs> management, Dogma has been, has capitulated itself to the capitalist industrial complex. That's just the way it is. We need to change things fundamentally. And we've got the opportunity to do it. Whether you're, you're already in work, whether you're a student, whether you're a professor, professor, whether you're an academician, there is something different. We are not cogs in a, in a machine that are imminently replaceable by the next cog. We're humans. We're flesh and blood and bone and heart and spirit in relation to each other. Nobody can take that away from us. But we've chosen, partially because from the first day at school when we're told, sit down, be quiet, do your own work, don't share and leave quietly, this is the story that we start to tell ourselves. But we all know what it's like to be in the playground with a group of kids. We figure it out, right? We know how to play together. You get a group of women into, into a kitchen, we know how to cook together. Men as well. Sorry, I shouldn't be sexist. <laughs> we know what to do. But it goes back to what Diego is saying. We choose to tell ourselves this story. This story is an old story. It is not our story. We can write a new story starting now. Thanks very much. Do you want to share? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think you should share the next one. I'm going to take some questions in a second, but Diego just wants to share something. One more, quick. There you go. Soy pésimo para hablar de de plata, pero bueno, tengo que aprender también. No se escucha, sí, sí. Esto, en el fondo, lo, lo construimos entre todos y queríamos ser súper transparentes con, lo, con la, los costos de, de, de vivir. Sí. No, no, it's working. It's working. Yeah. So, just to, to know, we have, <laughs> tenemos, <laughs> tenemos dos eh, ítems, lugar y el, los costos de traducción. Eh, íbamos a tener catering, lamentablemente no teníamos espacio donde tenerlo porque vieron la feria afuera y nos dijeron, es imposible, 250 personas no tenemos dónde, así que estamos todos invitados por aquí cerca a seguir conversando, pero tiene que ser fuera de la, de la universidad. 
Eh, este es un, un, ese es el total de lo que nos salió, de lo que costó esto. Y una invitación a compartir entre todos los costos. ¿cierto? Desde la invitación, este es solo un ejemplo, 5.000 pesos por persona. Pero es también desde chequear cuánto valor me aportó, porque aquí no estamos ni siquiera considerando las horas de Susan ni, ¿cierto? ni de todos los que participaron, y no es, ni, ni, no es la intención tampoco, pero sí eh, chequear cuánto es el valor que me, que me aportó a mí esto, esta conversación, aún queda, vienen preguntas y respuestas, y de acuerdo a ese valor y mi capacidad de pago hoy día, aporto, sin ningún compromiso, sin ningún compromiso, sin ningún límite... ¿Ya? Van a haber varias formas de, de poder contribuir. Van a haber unas bolsas que, donde pueden simplemente echar billetes. Donde hay un, va a haber una lista donde se pueden inscribir. Eh, ¿cierto? Pueden pagar también, no sé. Afuera, afuera van a haber, va a haber la posibilidad de, de, que lo, de que lo hagan. Hacer un depósito también, inmediatamente. Me dicen desde... Eso, y por ahí van a estar, van a haber unas bolsitas eh, dando vueltas por si, por si quieren eh, participar. Y Susan bien, va a dejar ahora un tiempo para preguntas y respuestas. Van a haber micrófonos ahí. Yeah, I just wanted to add to add to this as well. One of the things that is also very difficult in organizations based on trust and love is to talk about money. But if we don't talk about money, we cannot be sustainable. So if we can do it honestly and transparently and on a value exchange model, then I think that we can start to figure out how we can sustain each other and bring this opportunity to more people. Okay, enough about money. Open for any questions, and you can ask your questions in Spanish because I've got my. I think it's working now. Hello? Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing uh, your experience and uh, your consciousness. <laughs> uh, the question that I have is uh, if you can uh, share with us how uh, Inspiral uh, works and coordinates activities with other organizations uh, across the different countries. Mm. Thank you, that's a great question. And that's going to be a big part of our conversation this, uh, this midwinter uh, about growth. We are doing it currently quite ad hoc. I would say that our probably our two strongest relationships are with a network um, from France called WeShare. Are you, anybody familiar with WeShare? Yeah, so WeShare is a, is a, a community Um, they're in South America. I know that they're in uh, Brazil and Argentina. So this is one way that we try to amplify each other's message. So, for example, I'm going to um, yeah present a masterclass at the We Share Festival in France. Um, they use Lumio. So it's about how do we find similar organizations? Again, not colonizing, not the same, but how we can amplify each other's messages. So, for example, today, the um, Platforma um, conversation, very resonant in terms of the same type of mission. So I can see us having an ongoing relationship with, with this organization. Uh, we've got an organization in Montreal and Canada called Percolab, which we are doing a lot of work with. They introduced us to do some work with the Professional Society of HR Practitioners in Quebec. So anything that can amplify or give voice to this in either grassroots activist or in traditional professional orders is uh, a way that we're trying to amplify each other's messages. 
I think I'll have a clear sort of um, scaffold for that in a year's time, but, it, but it's something that's very important for us. Not, not because we're trying for world domination, but it's about how do we amplify each other's messages. Thank you. Hi, Susan, thank you. Um, the question is about future organizations. What's your vision about future governments? Are emerging new countries online? What's happening? Spiral is, uh, spiral is, a, is a clue. So this is a really good question. So uh, there are two countries, both in Asia, which are actually have changed the way that citizens are participating with government. The first is Taiwan. So uh, about three years ago, there was a, uh, an initiative for all Taiwanese people to have active participation via a digital platform called Polis with the government. So this is starting to happen from a, uh, from the perspective of citizen participation. Also recently in Korea, so, so Rich Bartlett was in Korea when um, the students and everybody was in the street and they overthrew the corrupt um, president. And the mayor of Seoul invited Rich to come and be a sort of honorary citizen of Seoul because Lumio is providing a platform for more participatory citizenship in countries. Podemos is another example uh, from a political party point of view, but I am very hopeful, especially with countries that are used to quick changes, that citizen participation on a much broader scale is possible. My name is Claudia. I'm pleased to meet you. I have a few questions. Um, how is the participation, um, the decision making through the Lumio software? Um, because you're giving uh, the possibility to everyone to participate. But how is the motivation? Like, yeah, and that's, that's difficult, and that's something that we're always playing with. Um, we, tr we try some things. So we try to give a long enough time for people to engage. There's also a functionality within Lumio which allows uh, to at mention. So if there is somebody that you know in the community whose voice you think would be important to the discussion, you can specifically ask them to join the conversation. Um, and it all depends, right? Sometimes, and I'm guilty of this as well, if I'm busy, if I'm traveling, I might miss a whole week of participation and maybe I won't have a chance to catch up. So it's, it's, it's something that we're working on continuously. Um, but we also know that just because people aren't participating doesn't mean that they're not reading. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's an ongoing quandary, and it's just like anything like I shared before about um, doing the work of the network. Just because people want to participate and be in the network doesn't necessarily mean they want to do the work of the network. So yeah, this is a constant curiosity, but it's not something that we get very uh, worried about unless it drops off significantly, and we haven't had that happen yet. So how, how do you encourage them to participate when you see that the level of participation is getting lower? Pick up the phone, um, email, put something out on Slack, say, come on, guys, we need some more viewpoints in here, <coughs> more, more, more votes. And you said uh, before that it's similar to crowdfunding because of the budget, yeah. So you pick up projects that uh, grow inside, but you don't choose projects that are from outside? 
So anybody in the network can propose a project. It might be something that they are doing or it might be an initiative that they are supporting outside. But it needs to come from somebody that's within the network. So an example is um, one, one of our contributors is very passionate about um, coding for women. Mm -hmm. And so she is always raising co-budgets for um, initiatives for women coders, even though she might not be participating. Mm -hmm. So it can, as it needs to be raised by somebody within the network, but it doesn't necessarily have to be performed by that person or within the network. Right. Um, I think that the retreats are uh, an instance to grow the trusting relationships between of you, you, but how do you do it with people that are from overseas? So, so again, I was sharing the, um, the thank you to John. So, for example, if we have people that are overseas, we will put up, you can see in the season just coming up to the retreat, there will be 10 or 20 buckets for people to fund them to, to travel to come. We try to keep the cost very low so that people can participate. And we also, um, uh, especially our big summer festival is open for the family. So we do it in a beautiful place at the beach in summertime. So many people will bring their entire family. And this is one of the ways that we try to encourage participation in the retreats. And the last question would be, how can I get invited? <laughs> Come buy me a coffee. <laughs> Very well. Thank you. Ok, sí. Es eh, un agrado escucharte. En... Momento. Ah, ok. Yo no quiero hablar en inglés porque me sale mal. Es eh, un agrado escucharte. Small talk, pero es big talk para mí. Eh, la, la contradicción se usa entre la economía, la acumulación del win-win, de los juegos de suma cero que no existen. Pero siempre es la acumulación. Los economistas han demostrado en los últimos años que siempre la acumulación y la concentración es mayor. Y en Chile por lo menos el 0,1% de, de las personas acumula la gran riqueza de este país y en el mundo parece... Pequití lo mostró igual. Entonces, me encanta cómo ustedes distribuyen la renta después de un periodo, porque a veces no es un mes, sino que a veces puede ser dos meses. Y ustedes se juntan y, y sacan lo que tú necesitas, pero no menos que lo que necesitas, y los otros también hacen lo mismo. Entonces, cómo esta contradicción entre la economía muy voraz que, que devora, contra el espíritu, ¿no es cierto?, contributivo, colaborativo, autogestionado y con dedicación a ti, a tu self, a tu persona. Hay que hacer un, una, una, una psicoterapia a todo el mundo, digamos, para que esto funcione. O sea, lo digo en la parte, en la parte buena. Si no hay un cambio de conciencia, tú trabajaste, Susana, en dos corporaciones que nombraste y cuántos años, 20 años, no sé, muchos años, y, y tu cambio de conciencia se tuvo que producir después de un tiempo. Entonces esto que las organizaciones TIL que vienen de qué sé yo, de 15 años o de 10 años, eh, me acuerdo de Burtz Org, las enfermeras en, en Holanda y Heiligenfeld en Alemania, los hospitales, ¿Cómo cambian? Porque autogestionan, pero no están en el tema del el juego de suma cero, que, no, que es una utopía. No existe. Entonces es un cambio personal el que tiene que producirse para que esto se produzca. You're absolutely right. And, and, and I think the thing that gives me uh, hope and also relieves me of the burden is because I know that this is not the work of the next five or 10 years. This is the work of the next 50 or 100 or 200 years. We are at the vanguard. We are at the very beginning. But this will make you happy. So we've got Burtzorg in Holland. I'm working with a 1,200-person uh, um, 
uh, organization in Perth in Western Australia that do in-home um, services for disabled people, inspired by Bert Sorg, and they are turning to self-management. So little by little by little, probably not in our lifetime, maybe in our grandchildren's grandchildren's lifetime, but you're right as well, the personal shift has to happen. I was, who I was, I was talking to Pablo today or, um, and, and saying that I've had many instances now where somebody has called me and said, Susan, help me become teal. Uh, what? You know? And because they think, okay, so it's easier if I, I'm the boss, but I don't have to make decisions anymore, so I will let everybody make decisions until they make a decision that I don't like, and then I will come back and make the decision because I take all the risk and I am the boss anyway, right? Without that personal journey, without that personal internal development, it doesn't work. So you're right, it's a paradox and it's multi-generational change. You're welcome. Hola, eh, desde hace como un año más o menos sigo en Spiral y ha sido increíble poder como, como estar aquí presente y comparto la historia. Eh, es súper interesante igual cómo lo haces desde adentro de la organización, pero eh, me gustaría saber si hay alguna manera en que en Spiral esté como generando eco en las partes locales donde están los demás miembros a nivel mundial para compartir, digamos, con la comunidad en la que están presentes eh, lo que sucede hacia dentro de la organización y si de esta manera está generando también como cierto movimiento en, en la comunidad en la que están propiamente. So what is your proposal? <laughs> you can buy me a coffee and you talk. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, I think this is happening, this is happening everywhere. Uh, like I said, I was in Montreal last, uh, last month, and at the end of the talk, um, the host said, so who wants an Inspiral in Montreal? And everybody raised their hand. And I, I scolded him after and I said, the question you should have asked is who is willing to invest in building something like Inspiral locally? So any project, anything that you want to create, Inspiral will amplify, support, share, and yeah, be part of. So let's talk. Two more questions, I think. Yes. Okay. Hello. Hola, Susan. Hola. Um, mira, quisiera conocer cuál fue tu experiencia para poder armar un equipo que funcionara desde... Te explico. Eh, yo soy fundadora de una empresa que, después de mucho andar, eh, comenzamos a darnos cuenta que queríamos armar una empresa dif diferente, que fuera 100% sin fin de lucro, similar al modelo de LATE que vende agua en Chile, que fue una empresa pionera, pero del área inmobiliaria. Y lo que nos comenzó a ocurrir es que yo primero vendí, hipotequé mi casa, una empresa, y contratamos equipo para que desarrollara toda la parte de imagen y, y comenzáramos a avanzar en la organización. Y entonces dijimos a un grupo de personas, bueno, vamos a cambiar el mundo, vamos a aportar. Eh, unámonos en esto de que es crear una empresa que comercialice propiedades, donde haya mucho equipo técnico, personas de universidades, eh, que, puedan, que podamos desarrollar un, un servicio muy profesional y muy técnico, pero a la vez que las utilidades de esa empresa, luego de pagados todos los eh, honorarios y distribuidos los honorarios, pudiesen darse instituciones que terminen con la pobreza. Inicialmente eh, definimos un porcentaje de 10% de la facturación que íbamos a donar. Todo el mundo estaba súper de acuerdo. Pero cuando empezamos a facturar y tuvimos que hacer las primeras liquidaciones y se vio que ese monto que había que dar era mucho, comenzaron a, a los primeros problemas. Terminó, terminó la discusión en que yo volví a sacar un crédito <ríe> y, pagué, y entregué ese aporte a una fundación y bueno, finalmente esas personas salieron, terminaron saliendo del equipo porque no se sumaron 
a lo que era nuestro fin principal. Comenzamos un piloto hace dos años y medio y pensamos, el primer modelo que diseñamos, pensamos que era súper exitoso y que iba a ser increíble. Y ya vamos como en el modelo 24, que sí está funcionando. Pero mi experiencia ha sido que compartiendo, tomando un poco lo que dijo un, un, eh, uno de, nuestro, de los asistentes en esta reunión, que, hay que se necesita un despertar de la conciencia. Y, y siento que hay que además tener valores y principios muy firmes y también un líder. Porque muchas veces tocó que, que se generaban estos conflictos y alguien tenía que, bueno, eh, no podía quedar sin que alguien tomara una decisión final. Entonces yo me, me pregunto cuando escucho tu exposición, que me parece maravilloso lo que han logrado, ¿cómo poder aplicar esto a una realidad latinoamericana donde tenemos, un, desde mi punto de vista, pienso que tenemos un desarrollo de la conciencia distinto a lo que son sociedades más nórdicas, por ejemplo, donde se piensa más en el colectivo, y donde además tenemos un sistema capitalista que, nos, que hace que unos ganen mucho y que el 50% de la población gane eh, un sueldo que ro, ro, bordea el mínimo, y donde la desigualdad es tremenda. Entonces, vemos en la tele, televisión que lo único que se vende es el consumismo y la, y la compra de ciertas cosas, y entonces encontramos que las personas sienten que eh, para ser alguien tienen que tener, y eso crea un montón de dificultades. Y te lo, te lo pregunto, eh, te, mi pregunta es, ¿qué piensas, cómo piensas tú, que, que, cómo les resultó a ustedes poder armar un equipo que realmente funcionara? Porque inicialmente todos vamos como con muchas ganas a hacer el proyecto, pero quizás en el camino sucede que alguien no está de acuerdo ya con las reglas que se, que se desarrollaron. Y por supuesto que te invito a un café. So, so I think the key is you have to be talking all the time. So it's not just enough to have a, a, a vision or a strategy. You must constantly, every week, talk about do, uh, what are our principles still the same, are our values still the same? What is our social contract? Are we honoring how we want to be with each other? What is causing us tension? What needs to be discussed? None of this can be left to chance. You can't just, uh, my, in my experience, you can't just go off into a, um, a value-driven dreamland and expect because my heart says this is true that it's going to work, especially when you're hiring people, right? Especially when you know that you need people to do tasks and you might not have time to properly integrate them or understand if they really understand or share the same values or feel the same way. I think this is, this is a problem that I see time and time again with founders and businesses that are attracting people to something new and shiny and different, but that those individuals don't understand that they have to be different too, right? I can't bring my same uh, orange self, my same, um, <laughs> my, my same person that works in, uh, in a corporate to a, a not-for-profit or an NGO that wants to do things differently, especially if the organization is requiring me to be different and to continue to grow with the organization. And that goes back to the other book that I recommended. I think that reading the book in everyone culture will be very helpful for you moving forward in terms of the development because you can't rush an individual's developmental growth, but you can provide the opportunity for everybody almost every day to have a developmental experience. And it takes longer and it's harder, but if truly we believe that raising the level of consciousness is what's going to be required to sustain these new models, then we have to put that effort in. Una, una última pregunta. Porque estamos ya en la hora. Okay. Hello, thank you. Nice You're to welcome. meet you. Um, I know you are now in a more evolving, evolved uh, organization, but uh, 
we are in most uh, more traditional companies and we making efforts to move forward to collaboration but uh, I will I would like to know what would be from your point of view the main contribution of human resources department to the business opportunities for everybody to have developmental experiences. And from a traditional organization, that could start with uh, some sort of peer mentoring. So create circles or small groups of individuals that aren't in the hierarchy, that might be mixed from different people across the organization, and give them the opportunity to help support each other in their developmental goals. That might be one place that I would start. Because when you can start to harvest the power of the hive mind and the strength and the opportunity and the gifts of everybody on the team in a way that helps people to understand that it's just not the boss that knows everything, then you can start to develop a sense of shared ownership of each other's experience. So that's where I might start. Thank you. You're welcome. And transparency, too. Tú no, nos recomendaste unos libros, Susan. Aquí tenemos también unos para, para ti. Mafalda, en inglés. Gracias, Gracias. 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 Estamos ya cerrando porque tenemos compromiso de terminar a las 8 por la gente que está acá a cargo y tenemos que ser respetuosos también con eso. Nada más que agradecer a Susan por, por querer compartir esto con nosotros, eh, con esa generosidad de no, no convencer, sino que ver qué quiere emerger de acá. En Chile ya hay cosas pasando, ya hay historias que contar. ¿ya? Esto está pasando hoy día, al mismo tiempo del otro. No quiero negar lo mismo que sale en la noticia, eso está, está también pasando. Pero hay otras cosas. Pero ahora les dejo la pregunta, ¿qué van a seguir ustedes compartiendo? ¿Qué historias van a contar? Los invito, ya que todos somos coorganizadores de esto, copartícipes, a sacarnos una foto al escenario con Susan. Sí, lo veo. 
Vamos a, vamos a crear un fanpage donde pueden ver, vamos a subir las fotos, los videos, todos lo, los contactos de Susan. Eh, organizaciones del futuro, ¿ya? Se lo mandamos en un correo a los que se inscribieron. Y los que tengan fotos pueden compartir ahí. Gracias. Fueron varias organizaciones las que organizaron el... Pero tú estás en la de... ¿Qué es lo que es Kairos Project? Pero ahora me Están como pasando este modelo. Y lo hacen acá en la universidad.